It feels like none of my inspirations are actually fantasy books. Is that weird? I mean, that's not really true, but... Hello, I'm Lydia Foxglove, and I am a fantasy author. Welcome or welcome back. I had a request to do a video about my inspirations. Inspiration began quite early in life when I began latching on to characters very hard. You know, like so many little girls want to be a princess or a warrior woman or a powerful sorceress, or in my case, a wealthy duck with a money bin. I'm a Capricorn, I feel like that explains that. Get it out of my system early. And then we had my next obsession as a wee thing, Zoobly Zoo, where I identified with the character of Bravo Fox. Bravo Fox was basically like if Henry Higgins was more gay and a furry. Pickering, why can't a woman be more like a man? I beg your pardon? Yes, why can't a woman be more like a man? I also read voraciously as a child and started writing from a young age. And I fell in love with the prose style of the children's books that I was reading over and over again like the Little House books, Narnia, Beverly Cleary's Ramona books, and especially Ella Montgomery's Emily series. For a long time, I actually reread the entire series every year. While her more popular counterpart, Anne of Green Gables, was like a ray of sunshine, Emily was moonlight. She was dedicated to writing from childhood, just like me. She loved cats and was more introverted and brooding, just like me. Unlike me, she had slightly pointed ears and occasional psychic episodes. I was obsessed. These are my copies and you can just see, oh my gosh, you can just see how much I brutalized these poor, poor books. But my fantasy world really started to take shape based on three things. Here's Anthony Xanth books. Final Fantasy II, or, or IV as it is now and properly known, and The Nightmare Before Christmas. I talked a fair bit about that in my History of My World Building video. So in this video, I particularly want to focus on what I think of as Phase Two. This is when I started getting more serious about fantasy writing and world building and working out a long and involved story. This was when I discovered Wendy and Richard Peeney's ElfQuest comics. I don't quite remember how or where it happened anymore, but at some point I got my hands on like a middle issue of ElfQuest and I barely understood what was going on. I just knew that this was one of the most amazing things that I had ever seen. Up until this point, a lot of the stories that I had really connected with were nevertheless written by men. One of the a few exceptions to this was that Caroline Thompson was one of the screenwriters of The Nightmare Before Christmas and also The Addams Family and The Secret Garden, all of which were definitely movies of my childhood. But ElfQuest was the first fantasy work I got my hands on that just felt like not feminine per se, not like something that a man could never read or enjoy, but it just felt like it was different, like it was written from a perspective I really connected with. And you might be wondering, where were all those wonderful fantasy novels written by women in the 70s and 80s? Where was Anne McCaffrey? Where was Mercedes Lackey? Where was Ursula K. Le Guin? Where was Sharon Shin? The list goes on. Well, I had to get nearly all of my books from the library and our library was not large and it was very obvious that the acquisitions people did not know anything about fantasy and also usually book one was always checked out or it was just lost. So it was very hard to read and keep up with fantasy series. I did get a little bit of Mercedes Lackey's Valdemar, which I loved. And at some point they got like new paperbacks of Tamara Pierce's Alana series, which we definitely loved. But every book you could find at the library that was like fantasy with a little romance to appear to teen girls, we were just devouring that. It was seriously slim pickings. Wendy Peeney's world building and characters were so well realized. I desperately needed something like ElfQuest and it came at just the right time. If you aren't familiar with ElfQuest, it is an independent comic book that started in the late 70s following a tribe of elves around their world as they meet other elf tribes in different regions with different cultures and there's all these complicated relationships and there's romance and epic drama and war. It was quite amazing to me 
at the age in which I found it, which I think was 12. What particularly amazed me at this point is that every elf in the tribe, and I can't remember how many there are exactly, I'm sure I could look it up, but and we, you know, let's say there's 20. Every one of them had distinct facial features and personality you really could instantly get a grasp for who each person was. Considering this huge cast, she manages to make a lot of these characters distinct from each other. And in the space of a comic, like this isn't an 800 page fantasy novel, she has a pretty limited amount of time to have dialogue. A lot of this has to be conveyed with just how characters move and what their facial expressions are. Plus the artist side of me to this day struggles to make characters look that distinct, like when I think of my favorite manga or like how every Disney girl has looked the same for the past however many movies. Most people don't bother to give every single character a different face, but in ElfQuest, you could just see like a nose and you could probably identify whose nose it was. ElfQuest was the first story I experienced where a part of my subconscious brain was just convinced that this was a real place and all these characters were real. And that although Wendy had only shown us what was necessary for the story, there was a whole bunch of stuff going on outside of the comic book, the elves lived full lives in their entirety. It was also the first time I had delved into a story that was so long and kept evolving and spanned thousands of years. This really shaped how I approach my fantasy world. In years to come, I started thinking more epic and large scale. I started trying to define more history for my characters, more very distinct cultures. And the characters in my fantasy world, even through so many evolutions, still have a decent amount of DNA from ElfQuest. There is still a group of people who are telepathic, who are put somewhat at odds with a group of people who are not telepathic. They all have pointed ears that are rather in Wendy Peeney style. There is a tribe of winged elves that take a lot of inspiration from the character of Tildak. And when ElfQuest starts, the humans are living in tribes, and as the story progresses, the humans get more advanced until you even see humans in space in one of the side comics. And there are more complicated relations between humans and elves as human society progresses. In my fantasy world, my characters discover our culture through a portal and they start to import it and it affects their culture in all sorts of complicated ways. Also, because ElfQuest was a comic, every issue had a letter section with replies and a letter from the editor that Richard Peeney would write. So you got to get these regular updates on their life and what they were interested in and what they were doing and see them interacting with the fans. And in a pre-internet era, an independent comic gave you a sense of community that no other media of the time could really match. And then we have the big elf quest gatherum. I'm guessing it said gatherum and not like gatherum or something. This was a Christmas present I received when I was 12 and it was full of interviews and essays and information on how Wendy developed the elves when she was young. But the piece that really blew my mind at this age was Wendy's essay, Women, Comics, and Elf Quest. ElfQuest had a lot of elements that now seem quite common in female-driven fantasy, and I say fantasy in both senses of the word. For one thing, it had male leads, and Wendy always said that she really identified with Cutter, the leader of the Wolf Rider elf tribe. I identified more with male characters as a kid, and although in hindsight, part of that definitely had to do with the types of female characters that were presented to me, they just didn't get as much range to be interesting. Every other girl around me seemed perfectly content to pretend to be girls and pretend games and draw girls and write things about girls. I seem to be the only one that was really uncomfortable with being a girl in my fantasy and I felt like a total weirdo and I also really like to have characters that either had disabilities or were in some way kind of traumatized or broken and I felt strange for that too. At one point we had one of our friends over and she was like, you really like handicapped people, don't you? and I felt so weird. I didn't have any psychological understanding of why that was, but I knew it was true. And certainly if there was any kind of ism that was perfectly acceptable in the 80s and 90s, it was ableism. So this essay, although rather dated now, basically explained me to myself. Many girls and even women spend time fantasizing, not just about connecting with males, but about being males. Some women actually enjoy seeing male characters injured or helpless because they find emotional empathy with the pain to be stimulating. Sounds kinky? Maybe. 
But not only is it harmless, it may spring out of that same well from which a woman draws compassion and the desire to ease others' pain. In their fantasies, if the hero is helpless and hurt, he is harmless, approachable, and oh do the young girls want to touch the hero, they empathize. Obviously, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but at the time, it told me that two core parts of my creative being were normal, imagining myself in a male role and torturing said self in the role, or torturing the role, anyway. It all made sense. The men, the men, the beautiful, vulnerable, damaged men. I wasn't a weird girl for writing them, or if I was, I was the same kind of weird as Wendy Peeney. So sign me up. Just a few years after ElfQuest, all of these ideas would suddenly explode upon me in the form of shoujo anime and manga, which shamelessly hit all the same buttons in spades from Sailor Moon to Fushigi Yugi. And for that matter, even outside of so-called girls anime, can you imagine any Western cartoon from 1979 featuring a man as beautiful and psychologically complicated as Char Aznable? <laughs> It's also great for relationships because my partner and I have watched hundreds of hours of space opera and we both get plenty out of it. Anime and manga opened me up to so many things, including just different storytelling priorities. I noticed that anime and manga often had a broader range of like romance and very tragic things happening, including characters dying and not coming back and like goofy humor. And then they'd even intersperse like little slice of life moments in there. To me, this felt so much more accurate to real life. Like real life is hilarious and really depressing and sometimes romantic and sometimes I just want a bowl of noodles. So I found myself incorporating more of that into my stories, more of a range. Most of my stories have some humor and they have some moments that are bittersweet or even sad and they also have like pets and hobbies and food. Like I'm trying to get through the Akatar series right now and I'm like a third of the way into A Court of Mist and Fury and I'm at this point where I really just wish that the characters would all gather around a hot pot and there'd be like some cats like just give me a little scene like that and suddenly I would like all the characters so much more that's just me though while good stories do still influence me to this day like doll girl meets dead guy it was a definite debt to the undertaking of heart and mercy which is such a me book oh my gosh the most profound influences on my writing were pretty much set by the time I was out of my teens. A lot of my favorite characters were already in place. The way the world works, the vibe, the general writing style, it was all there at that point. There's not as much room for something to really blow your mind and change everything, nor should I have probably. There was just one missing piece that maybe not every artist needs, but for me, it was extremely important. I needed to get more in touch with my own identity as a creator and my self-confidence. I was a shy and nerdy girl just wearing like a plain black shirt and jeans and knockoff Doc Martens just like lurking in the corner with my sketchbook. I was kind of in those teenage doldrums where Everything has to be kind of serious and you don't want anyone to really see you having too much fun. My characters were cool, but I didn't really think of myself as cool. It didn't even enter my conception to make myself into a cool character. One day my cousin rented a movie that would send me down a rabbit hole. This movie was Velvet Goldmine, a glittering gay homage to the early days of 70s British glam rock. A sort of faux David Bowie biopic with the soundtrack of T-Rex, Roxy Music, Brian Eno, and other glam rockers of the time. They couldn't actually get the rights to use any of Bowie's music, I think, but nevertheless, the look and the sound of this movie just blew my mind and I immediately sought out the source inspiration, David Bowie. This was around 2000, 2001, in a moment where Bowie was not really in the public consciousness whatsoever. I was working at Sears at the time and almost none of my coworkers knew who David Bowie even was. I had somewhat of a hilarious conversation with one girl and she was like, I finally saw David Bowie, he's hilarious. And I was like, I mean, yeah, he can be. I mean, did you see like any of his music? And she's like, 
No, like on Frasier. Um, oh, oh, you mean David Hyde Pierce. I mean, to be fair, he's, he's a skinny little guy. Whew. Anyway, I got obsessed with Bowie and anything and anyone Bowie adjacent. The music, the fashion, the androgyny, the general aura of it all, and perhaps more than anything, the confidence, the swagger, the peacockery. That late 60s, early 70s rock star vibe of looking incredible and acting like somebody, even if you are actually nobody at all. One thing I had read about Bowie at some point was that he would dress like a star and act like a star, even when he was really just kind of like a skinny nobody who was obsessed with mimes and 2001 A Space Oddity and Andy Warhol. So basically just another weird nerd kid like me, except I will never live up to the mood that is David Bowie. Do you get fan mail? Yes, a lot. What, um, is it scabrous or dangerous or interesting or exciting? It's very sexy. <laughs> I learned something very important from him though. Just don't be afraid to be who you want to be, who you feel like on the inside. At this point, I started wearing vintage clothes and sometimes I'll meet someone who's like, I love your clothes, but I could never wear vintage. I would feel too fancy. I wouldn't know how to style it. And if you've ever felt like that about a piece of clothing you love, just wear it. You don't have to style it. I don't like style things. I just put them on and no one cares. No one sees me come into a room and is like, the fancy, it burns. I mean, maybe if you have like a collection of vividly colored prom dresses or something. Although you know how fascinating it would be if you actually wore a brightly colored prom dress to something. I started allowing myself to be as cool as the characters in my books, whether it was the clothes or sometimes just plain reconnecting with this sense of fun and whimsy and possibility that exciting things could happen to you. This really helped to grow my confidence and battle that sense of imposter syndrome that can creep in throughout a career, especially the first time you're in a room with a bunch of people who are more famous than you. I mean, there's also direct inspiration in my books. Like there are so many David Bowie types lurking in there. So that was my last huge earth shattering inspiration. In some ways it's a little sad that I don't make new things, my entire personality for a year anymore. But at some point you kind of need more stability. Thank you so much for being here and I would love to know what inspired you. I am always so fascinated what is like that thing you discovered when you were 10 or 12 or 16 that just shaped who you are to this day. So if you want to drop in the comments what that thing is for you, I think that would be a lot of fun. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I try to post once a week about the creative life in general and fantasy writing in particular. I've also started having a weekly post that I put on both Substack and Patreon where I answer questions that I've been getting on this channel. I don't know if I'll do it every week. It depends how many questions I get, but if you want to see more from me, you can also join those. I'll see you next time. Bye.